Tom Woodruff Jr. And I'm Alec Gillis. Yeah, it, it's like mind boggling the history that you guys have with special effects and everything. But, mind boggling um, because it's because it's so long. And so <laughs> My body because it's like almost everything I love like you guys have oh, done yeah. situation because <laughs> I love aliens and I'm a scaredy cat pretty honest but you guys are here to talk about Pennywise so. it's interesting because like like you you know mentioned we have been doing this for so long and we've been through the whole round of different materials and developmental things and new techniques and and Pennywise is remarkably a very simple kind of throwback approach and materials. It's very simple. It's a foam latex makeup that has been around since the 1930s. Um, what was novel and what I think was, was great about it for us as, as makeup designers, makeup artists, is that it gave us an opportunity to do something very subtle. Yes, he's got a very big bulbous head, but he's also got very subtle appliances that sort of fill in the hollows of his cheek. There's a little nose tip, everything to make him look very uh, uh, the essential child kind of quality of, of a smooth, nice round egg-shaped face, but in a very subtle way. Can you explain the whole like red streak that goes up to his eye? I'll I'll tell you that comes from the director Andy Muschietti. Andy himself is a is a really accomplished uh, sketch artist, uh, and and if you look him up, if you look on his Instagram, you'll see he's got some really nice uh, line drawings, and he gave us a line drawing of Pennywise that was very close to this. Our job was to interpret it in the real world, bring it to life as a design. Basically, you take a, you take a 2D sketch and then you, a lot of design work goes into turning it into a, a, an actual makeup. But he had established a lot of the, the, the basics. When I look at this, I think of um, Salvador Dali's mustache, you know, that he had. So. The beauty of this makeup is that it's not a fancy groundbreaking materials we didn't you know put the actor through some incredible amount of pain to get this these are techniques that have been around it is the uh, it, it is a testament to the quality of the design uh, and and the subtlety of the execution. So basically, it's it's foam latex pieces glued to Bill's face, sculpted very carefully to get this kind of childlike quality, and pieces glued to Bill's face, and then you have a you have an actor's performance that brings it to life. I feel like practical effects and special effects are kind of going down to the wayside, or it's just going to be like a different. We're going to see something else entirely. I think we're seeing right now is is the pendulum is still swinging in the direction of, of practical effects, which is what we're big believers in, but we're also big believers in being able to use digital effects to help enhance what is done practically. And we're finding that most of the visual effects artists uh, uh, and supervisors are on the same page as we, you know, in, the, in that they're saying, give us as many real things as you can and we'll enhance and we'll go the extra step. And again, I'm not talking about full CGI characters like the new Planet of the Apes movies are absolutely amazing. Yeah. You know, Peter Jackson stuff is breathtaking, but those are the few and farther between gigantic budgets that can sustain that kind of work. We're talking about something that is used more as a tool that makes what we do either simpler on set by removing puppeteers or rods or cables or gives us a little bit extra uh, uh, impact on screen than what we're able to do or, what that, or maybe than what we've been have given the time to do during the build. What would be like a great resources that you would direct them to now? versus like in the 80s and everything. Yeah, well, when we started, there was no resources. You'd find a little picture in Famous Monsters magazine and try to figure it out or make some phone calls and talk to you know somebody on the other end that you've never met. Or Tom was good at writing letters to his idols and things. But now, of course, you've got the internet and you have an explosion of information. So all across the world, kids can get exposed to these techniques and they can try them out themselves, whether they're cosplayers or they're making haunted houses or prop replicas or whether they're doing movies uh, makeups for their own movies and one place we always send people is to the Stan Winston School of Character Arts online. It was uh, uh, formed by our friend and the son of um, our, our mentor. Uh, uh, Stan Winston was our mentor and his son Matt Winston um, founded the, the company and they do a great job with uh, tutorials and explanation of, of materials. If uh, No matter what, how serious you are or, or, or casual you are, they're um, they're really, uh, they're really a font of information. Of all the wonderful creatures and everything that you created, is there something that you haven't created that you're itching to create now? Mm. <laughs> 
We've been, we've been lucky. It's been so good to be able to have the career that we've had, to be able to do so many things that some have been personal favorites of mine, some have been personal favorites of Alec. I think for us right now, the, 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 the real attraction is to kind of take the next step and to be creating our own characters, not just as makeups, but on the page as scripts and as directors and writers and producers and creating our own content of all kinds of different levels, which is really going to be exciting. Uh, next year's our 30th anniversary, and we've got some pretty amazing things about to happen in, in, in light of us expressing ourselves as, as creature makers in a whole different way. Well, thank you so much, you guys, for taking the time to chat and creating another scary clown for us all to have nightmares about. Thank you, thank you so much. Hi, I'm Bart Mixon. I uh, did the uh, special makeup effects for the original Stephen King It in 1990, Tim Curry's Pennywise and the other uh, creatures in the show. Go a little bit about the background of it. Um, yeah, I was, again, the makeup effects supervisor, so I did uh, design the Pennywise makeup um, and apply it. I designed, sculpted, and applied it. Uh, Initially, I did a handful of designs before Tim was cast, but those didn't really, it was kind of meaningless till I had an actor. Uh, once Tim was cast, I did multiple sketches. Um, I narrowed, the, I probably did about five or six line drawings, then I narrowed those down to like three that I did uh, what we call clay sketches, which we took his head cast and then rendered them in clay, and then I painted them and uh, threw like a, just a quick wig on him and took photos to send to the director to get some, some feedback from him. From those three, he picked the one that he liked, uh, which one, one was, um, I think the other two were heavier than what we ended up with, uh, just in terms of more prosthetic coverage on his face. So he picked the one that he liked, which was a, a headpiece, an upturned nose, cheekbones, and a chin, which was kind of a stylized clown version of the Lon Chaney Phantom of the Opera. That's, like, that's why he's got like the turned up nose and the receding hairline and that sort of thing. Um, so once uh, Tommy uh, Lee Wallace picked that design, then I re-sculpted it in uh, clay and broke it down to be a makeup. Uh, and again, it was a, a headpiece, a nose, cheeks, and a chin. We uh, took those up to Canada and did two makeup tests on Tim. Uh, Tim wanted to wear, I guess, as little as possible. And so the initial test was just the headpiece and the nose, because I knew those were going to be there regardless. And then Tim had some thoughts on the patterns, the paint scheme, which was pretty minimal. And uh, then on the same day, we then, after we photographed that, then we put the cheek and the chin on it. And then I did a paint scheme a little closer to what I wanted. And then, then we kind of met in the middle. So um, just in terms of the final patterns and whatnot, that was uh, Tim's input, Tommy Lee Wallace's input, and then and mine. So it was the three of us, you know. And then knowing that Tim Curry is like this very energetic kind of actor, was there any kind of like technical difficulties like when you, when you found trying to put it onto Tim Curry or anything or while in production? Uh, no, I mean, Tim was certainly a pro. He had worn a lot of makeup before, so he, he uh, took care of it as, as much as you would want a performer to take care of. Um, I, had a, just, I had a few issues with sweat sometimes just because of the, it was in the summer, it was up in Canada, it was humid. Um, so there were, um, you know, uh, it was a, there's a material called Pax paint that we based him out with, which is an acrylic paint mixed with a prosthetic grade glue. And so it doesn't really let sweat pass through it. So we would get sweat bubbles. So I would have to blot them and not, if you wiped it, you could like wipe the makeup off. So I would basically just take a powder puff and just, just press it out uh, to, to chase the, so that was probably the, the biggest maintenance issue. But, but I mean, Tim, he took care of the makeup. He was very respectful. In fact, I saw him at Creature Features about a year ago and he was actually very, complimentary very flattering of the makeup after, uh, after we finished it he was doing the Oscar that uh, Stallone movie that John Landis directed and he invited me by the set you know to watch some of the filming on that so he, he was a very cool guy you couldn't ask for a nicer guy to you know to apply makeup to so did you um do you still have any of the original cast or anything uh, I have uh, I did I, I made three wigs for the show I did manage to keep two of those so my father actually in Houston Texas has a pseudo museum that uh, I have display heads so like I took like Tim's life cast uh, did a fiberglass head glued the appliances on it put some false eyes in it put the wigs on it you know painted them up so um, so I've got those I've got uh, the spider puppet we still have that uh, 
Yeah, it's unfortunately it's 27 years old. It's not. It's in horrible shape. Wait, I mean, how big is it? Uh, it was as big as it is in the movie. Really it's, big, oh yeah, it's like 16 feet long, and uh, it unfortunately it's latex and polyfoam, which holds up better than foam latex. But it's still it's it's almost like peanut brittle. It's very very fragile so it's just kind of sitting in a corner and it if you move it it's just going to crumble all the the werewolf the mummy the the al marsh corpse the the head in the fridge all all those all those things i did everything but the fortune cookies uh um those, everything but the fortune cookies. yeah well those i think the because we shot it in canada and i think the effects guys up there wanted to do have some fun so i said well they can they can have the cookies i mean the the spider i wanted something that was spider like but not a spider um, so I thought we came up with a pretty cool design. A friend of mine, Joey Orozco, did the bulk of the design on it. And then uh, I had some input. Aaron Sims helped him uh, sculpt and paint it. And Aaron's like one of the top creature designers these days. Um, but I, I thought we came up with a good um, creature. In fact, I was showing, I have some behind the scenes video of it that uh, there's uh, Dead Mouse Productions is doing Pennywise, the making of it. And I showed them this video, and they're like, we had no idea this thing could do as much as it did because I, I, don't, think they, I don't think they used the best takes necessarily <laughs> in the show. It, it, it was capable of doing more than, than what you see in the movie. I think if I had delivered a puppet that did as little as you saw on TV, they would have been mad. It is unfortunate that it's the climax of the movie and you don't have Tim Curry, but, I mean, again, that's pretty much the way it is in the book, so, you know, it's bl blame Stephen King. <laughs> so then if you could have changed it, how would have you had, like, changed it? I don't know if, because um, I mean, I think it's in keeping with the movie because it, you know, it's a werewolf, it's a mummy, so it's not unrealistic that it would appear as this spider. That was never intended to be its real form. That was just, so, it was just trying to scare him. That was like its last effort. Um, I was, before I saw the new it, I was thinking like, well, maybe like after they wounded it, if when they find it in the cave, uh, when they beat it to death, if that had been Pennywise again, it might have been a little bit more satisfying. But I don't know that 1990s television would have let three adults beat the crap out of a clown on TV and rip his heart out. So. Well, thank you so much. I mean, that's a wonderful history behind Pennywise. And just like one more question. So how do you like the new version of Pennywise? The, the one's very cool. I think uh, the guys at ADI did a great job with it. Um, again, I am a little envious that they've got an extra hour and a half and they don't have 1990s censorship you know to inhibit them so uh, i look forward to seeing part two but i enjoyed the, the part one very much thank you so much for taking the time